man, good to see you guys. I uh, really was enjoying my moment of worship this morning. I want to encourage you with something. When you have time, it doesn't, just like John was saying, it doesn't have to be a set song. Set songs sometimes help you. But I want to encourage you to start blocking out some time for worship. Now, now listen, I know we have traditions in the American church, and we think worship, well, you got to sing. Sometimes one of the greatest acts of worship that you can do is be still before the Lord. Are you ready for this? And be quiet. Don't turn anything on. Now, I, lo I love having worship music, but there are moments when God wants you to be quiet. In, in the stillness, he will speak to you. Don't look for signs. I think that's a mistake too much of the church makes. Lord, give me a sign. Send me three red Corvettes by. Huh? Have somebody call this out. or say, Stop all that. You have the spirit of God inside. You, you have a sign. He hung on a cross and died for you. He loves you that much that he gave, he gave you his spirit. So as you begin to dig into your new life, and I know some of you have been born again longer than me, but how many of you believe there are new chapters in your journey of faith? I believe with, with what the Lord is dealing with me about that our church is entering into a new chapter. Well, what's it look like? I don't know. Sometimes you just have to be still and wait on the Lord and trust him. Yeah? So my new talk today called renovation. How many of you have ever been through a renovation project? Michaela, you know a little bit about that, don't you? Yeah. We always like the end result, but in the process... Not so much. Let's start this morning. I want to share a story with you out of 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, let me set this up because this is in the season of Elisha, the prophet, ministering to the people of God. And the thing you need to understand about both Kings and both Chronicles, these are actual historical facts. It's not just inspiration from God. These are factual events that have taken place. And the king of Syria wants to destroy Israel. It seems like you continually see that repeatedly. The enemy is always wanting to destroy the people of God. Nothing has changed. But in the process of this, Elisha, the prophet, continually reveals to the Israeli army the king of Syria's next move. And so they're, they're always a step ahead of them. Now, this is the brilliance of the kingdom of darkness. The king of Syria decides, well, listen, where is Elisha? Because his, his, one of his servants told him, he said, the prophet sees what you talk about in the bedchamber at night. He knows what's going on before you make a decision. But now, all of a sudden, this king thinks for some reason he's going to sneak up on Elisha. Right? And he actually tries, so he sends his army to where Elisha is, they have found him, and Elisha's kind of, you know, he's pretty, he's an intense prophet. I don't know if you know this about Elisha, but as he walked in the ministry of the Lord, the, the reason I relate so much with Elisha is because there's a cool story. Elisha was ministering, and there's a group of teenagers that came out and started mocking him because he was, he was bald. Yeah. And... The Lord struck them with, the, he allowed bears to attack them. So tread lightly when you talk about your brother. <laughs> All right? But Elisha, he is, he is pretty, he, he's intense, but he's always laid back because he knows where he stands with God. Let's pick this up. The city of Israel is surrounded. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I know most of you know this story, but I want to, I want to give you some perspective here. And then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. What eyes? 
because he's already seeing the army. And Elisha says, open his eyes. Now, I know you all know the answer. You're saying spiritual eyes. I, I get that. But do you know what that means, spiritual eyes? That's seeing in a different dimension. He says, open his eyes that the young man can see. And, and, the, and the Lord opened his eyes and the young man saw and the mountain was full of horses and chariots. What kind? Of fire. <laughs> I mean, it'd be cool if they just regular horses and chariots, but no. We got chariots of fire, horses of fire. What's that look like? How do you take care of one of them? Huh? And, uh, and, and, the, and the servant of God, or the servant of the man of God, sees into this dimension. Here's the thing. This is, I, I share this story because I want to introduce not so much what took place, because if you read the story, Elisha prayed God, strike them with blindness. Now, I know some of y'all have wanted to pray some stuff like that over people before. God, get them. We are in a new covenant. We don't pray for God to get people. The vengeance is the Lord's. He will get people. You don't have to worry about God having your back, okay? But in this particular case, the Israeli army was surrounded, including the prophet. And he said, Lord, strike him with blindness. And guess what happened? He struck him with blindness. Wow. I know some of y'all thinking, man, I wish my prayers were answered like that. I think there's a lesson to learn here. To get to where that kind of prayer is petitioned and, and uh, delivered on, I believe we need to walk in the place that he walked. I know a lot of people just want this kind of power, but you don't, you don't get that kind of power to just run around at the park. It's for a reason. So God struck this entire army with blindness, and then the prophet leads them right into the Israeli army's hands, and then the king asks the prophet, I want you to see the power here. The king asked the prophet, shall I kill him? And the prophet said, no, let's feed him, and let's win him over. And that's exactly what happened. See, sometimes God's way is going to be different. Here's the thing. How many of us, I think we're like Elisha's servant, and I think what we need to do is we need help to see things from a different perspective. See, all Elisha's servant could see was from a natural standpoint, and God had to help him. This is why it's important for you and me as the born again to grasp the reality that God has built us with the ability to see through the lens of his promises. See, here's, here's the thing. We get so consumed with our religious traditions. See, God wants, God wants to move us. Listen to me carefully now because you, you'll let this just slip right past you because I wrote it and it slipped right past me. God wants to move us from an intellectual process to a spiritual one. And being spiritual sometimes will not make sense to the natural. In the natural, Elisha's servant could not comprehend what was going on. He had no concept that he was surrounded by horses and chariots of fire. Well, there's somebody driving that chariot of fire. Yeah? This means for us today. Now, you know, as, we, as, I, as I present these things to you, these thoughts, these truths... It's never out of some legalistic approach. You got that? God despises religion. Jesus told the religious world of that day, the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil. See, what God is looking for is people that will be humble. That's one of the first things when you go back and study the life of the prophet Elisha, Elijah on a number of occasions tried to tell Elisha, stay here, I'm going. Stay here, I'm going here. But Elisha wouldn't. He said, wherever you go, I'm going. Whatever it takes for me to be around this anointing, I'm going to do it. Amen. But we're not there today because we are a society of convenience. <laughs> so in order for us to pursue something different, we got to do something different. This means change for us. And one of the, you know, one of the things you have to understand is this. 
Change is something that we only like when it's something we want. You know, I came in here this morning and, man, it was hot in here. Well, we lost power this morning. And so it, it took a little bit, I guess, for the AC to respond. I'm like, what's going on in here? But it's starting to cool down now. Some of y'all be like, no, it's cold. <laughs> Change is good when we want it. When you want it cool in the room and you can adjust the thermostat, that kind of change is wonderful. But what about when God wants to change something in you that you've been used to for years? See, here's the thing. Our new talk, renovation, it is geared towards us taking a minute and self-evaluating and asking ourselves, are we even open to such a thing as a renovation project? Now, as I get into it, I want you to think about this because some people, like, like Michaela's family, they just went through an entire house renovation. Her dad's a builder, so it's a little easier for them. But some of us, we only do a bathroom renovation or a kitchen renovation. It doesn't have to be, I would recommend, don't try to start and renovate your whole house. Now, you know what the house is, right? You are the house of God. And there is a, listen, God has already submitted the work order for renovation. You just got to sign off on it. Are you willing to let God get in the chair with you and say, can we renovate this in your life? See, listen, this word, as I begin to think about this talk, the, the origin of the Latin in this word, renovate, it comes from two words. The first one is re, or to do again from the same. And the other is nova, which means to make new. So God's going to take your house and make it new. That's what a renovation is. A renovation is you take your old kitchen, same kitchen, but you make it a new one. How many of us are willing to let God open up a renovation project in our life today? See, this is what Jesus has done for us. He's given us this ability, and regardless of our current situation, regardless of what it looks like, Jesus loves to make things new for us. He's made a new way for us. He wants to give you a fresh start. He is the God of mercy and grace. His mercy is new every day. The Apostle Paul said, it is only by the grace of God that I do what I do. Because Paul was evil. He was the king of religion. And he got the revelation of who Jesus was, and then Jesus started renovating his life. He spent years working on Paul to get him to the place where he, you know, we're quoting him today. In the book of Revelation, Jesus actually makes this statement. He says, I make all things new. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about you. Now, here's the thing. In Christ, you are a new creation. Huh? Old things have passed away. But now your flesh, on the other hand, your carnal human nature, it probably needs a little work. Here's the thing, you ask anybody that's been through a renovation project and they will be the first to let you know that it requires, it requires some stuff. Huh? It requires adjustments, being flexible. It demands change. Are you ready for this? Patience. When you're in a renovation project and, and the, the subcontractor didn't show up, I mean, I know that probably didn't happen to you, but in the real world, it requires patience. A renovation project will absolutely cost you something. That's the Lord. Somebody might ought to get that. <laughs> that's, that's your work orders right there being called. <laughs> A renovation project will take you out of what you're used to, what you're comfortable with. Are you willing to submit yourself to let God do something like that in your life? Because I can tell you, we get, we get comfortable where we're at. We like things the way we like them. And then when the Lord introduces change, you remember Elisha's servant, God had to help him to see things from his perspective. God was doing something, and, and Elisha's servant, he couldn't grasp the realities of that. Elisha was really cool. He said, Lord, let him see what I see showing. You got us. 
Yeah. So let's be real. As we, now I know, I know some of you, you're not ready to submit to this project yet. You like your old kitchen. Huh? I know all the burners don't work right, but it, it's your kitchen. You're used to it, right? You click the knob a couple times and it works. Huh? That light switch that sometimes comes, huh? The disposal doesn't work. You, you want granite on your countertops. Yeah. I know we want that stuff. Then all of a sudden we start looking at what it's going to cost us, what it's going to do to our house, how it's going to inconvenience us. A renovation project will absolutely cost you. Jesus said this. He said, if you want to be my disciple, it will cost you everything. He said, if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. If you do what? Give up your life for him. What's that mean? Sometimes you got to give up your way. I can't tell you the number of people over the years. I was thinking the other day, I've been pastor for a little while now. I was talking to somebody, and, they, and I was telling them a little bit about my, mine and Tracy's story. I've been pastoring since 2000. Now, I worked for another church before that, but on my own, I've been pastoring since, so what is that? That's almost 24 years. Man, it's a long time, right? Well, <laughs> here's the thing. In all of that, I have discovered that God will require stuff of you, and it's not easy all the time. He'll place a demand on you to do something that's, something that's your, because what I've learned, man, we, we're used to stuff. I don't know why this keeps coming up in my spirit, but some of y'all, when you don't get your way, you lose your mind. The, and, and then some others, you, you got to have your way. I don't care what anybody says. Thank, thank, thank you, Shirley. I got, I got one. The rest of y'all just quiet up in here. Okay. The Christian journey, it can seem completely contrary to this natural world and our natural tendencies that we've developed over the years. There are things that you do because you've developed it over the years. My prayer with our new talk, Renovation, is that we make room for God to do a little, re little reno in our lives. We let God, <laughs> we let God in to our thinking. Huh? What about this one? We let God renovate our attitude. Y'all, y'all good church folks, so it's all quiet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We let God renovate our devotion time to him. Huh? We doing Okay. What about your decision making? Who, who gets the control of that? God, you know, I love you, Lord, but no. But don't, some of y'all are like, don't tell me what to do. I know some of you all, you're wonderful, God-loving people, but don't tell me what to do. You'll do it just to spite. Hmm. What about this one? How many of you are willing to let God renovate your love walk? Because the greatest commandment is what? Love God, love people. It will require some development, some renovation. Should I say it like this? Some transformation. I know you've heard me quote this scripture all the time, but as I'm putting my talk together, the Lord took me back to Romans chapter 12. It is one of the most crucial things that Paul ever wrote in the Bible. It says this in verse 1, I beseech you. This word beseech, Paul says, it's, it's basically, Paul is begging his church. Man, I'm begging y'all. Therefore, now you know what I teach you about this. Anytime you see a therefore, don't, don't just skim past that. If, when you see a therefore in chapter 12, verse 1, that means you got to do what? Go back to chapter 11. Come on, you all. And in chapter 11, Paul is talking about how the Jews were rebellious and God had to take the Gentiles and he grafted the Gentiles into the tree, into the root of the line of, of God. 
We were grafted in. I've, I watched a video one time of how a, a, a guy took and cut a chunk out of a tree and took another branch of a different tree and put it into that tree and sealed it up and taped it, and it, was gra- it became part of that tree. You have become part of God's tree. We are grafted in, and therefore, yeah. So when you read stuff about the Jewish people, that's me. In the spirit, I've been grafted in. And he says, I am begging you by the mercies of God that you, listen very carefully, this this will be the revelation that changes your life right here, that you present your body. Now, who's got to do the presenting? Because I can tell you over the years, one of the things I've heard from, from people when they pray is, Lord, take this. Lord, change this. Lord, do this. You present your body. <laughs> Y'all okay? <laughs> Maybe I should get a feel-good message and preach that one to you. Huh? I, y'all, y'all do understand, I didn't write Romans 12, right? Okay. That you, you present your body a living sacrifice. Here I am, Lord. What, what you want me to do? I want you to come in here and sit down and be quiet for a season. I want you to turn something off on your TV that you won't turn off. I want you to take a minute. I'm begging you. Present your body a living sacrifice. You know, when you look at a a sacrifice in the natural that is actually taken to the altar, it doesn't come back the way it was. It takes on a completely, most of the time it's consumed by fire. Yeah, Paul says, I'm begging you, present your body to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I really love how the NIV translates this passage right here. It says, which is your simple act of worship. See, one of the greatest acts of worship you can do, it's not singing a song. It's serving. It's offering your life to God. I love watching some of the volunteers that come through this building throughout the week just to put their hand to something. I'm talking about simple things, cleaning the building, taking out trash, mopping floors, packing stuff up, whatever it might be. Paul says, I want you to offer your life. And then he says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind so that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But it starts with this phrase. Guys, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by renewing your mind. This phrase, renewing your mind, it's an interesting thing. This word renew, when you look at it in the Greek, it literally, the word, it, it, it's, it's renovation. It really means that you have to make yourself available. Renew your mind. The Joshua 1.8 principle really does work when you meditate the word day and night. And God knows that you're busy people. You've got families, kids, careers. He understands that. But he still wrote this, knowing where we would be today. And I know we think we got it rough today, but when you're hungry, you go to the grocery store and buy food. You ain't got to go hunting. Well, just if I had the time they had back then, are you for real? They had to build a fire. They just couldn't go turn the stove on. They had to build a fire. They needed water. They, went, they didn't get a water bill. Their water bill was pack a bucket down to the river. I know we think we got it tough today. I love a toilet. <laughs> I love a shower. With warm water. Huh? Make yourself available. Now, that's going to look different for every one of us, but you have to start, you all. You have to pick a window of time that you have, and you have to set it aside for God. Once again, not out of some legalistic thing. Renewing your mind. Let God renovate the way you think. Sometimes we simply need to renovate, here's the thing, what we've been fixed on for years. 
Because some of us, what we do, we establish these strongholds in our mind. And when it comes to renovation, you know, sometimes that's hard to do. So don't get conformed to the world. I, I love how the message paraphrases that statement, don't be conformed to the world. It says don't copy or become so well adjusted to today's culture that you fit in without even thinking. Man, does that fit us today? We get so used to what's going on around us. Well, that's just what we do today. That's just life. That's just, no, you are a different person now. And the number one tool, you hear me talk about this all the time. The number one tool the enemy uses because he will attack the mind. That's his target. He's not showing up like Hollywood portrays us, like he's this evil creature. No, that's, 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 that's in his mind. Now, he attacks right here between the ears. And the number one tool he uses is the media. You know, you know I'm, I hammer this all the time. Some of you all need to turn some of that stuff off. I know, I, and listen, go on, clap, yeah. I know some of you think, yeah, but I don't watch a lot of TV. All right, all you TikTokers. Man, you'll get sucked into that trap, and an hour later, you're still scrolling and watching stuff. Nothing to do with God. Well, I just didn't have time for the word this morning. You didn't? The enemy makes it attractive on purpose. He is very subtle. He is very, very uh, deceptive. He's seductive in his methods and very effective. And gradually... It starts getting into your thinking until it builds a stronghold in your life. And you're like, oh, that church stuff's not important. I don't need all that God stuff. And you, you convince yourself that you're okay with that. This is, this is why the Lord told us through the Apostle Paul and the, the Apostle James to give no place to the devil, to actually resist him. See, when you resist something, it takes effort to resist. Jesus actually tells us this, when you're... When you're reading this story, now he's talking about a dude in, in the old covenant, you know, because he hadn't went to the cross yet. And he's telling this story. He said, when a man's house is clean, or we could use the phrase renovated, and you leave the house empty, that enemy comes in with seven more and makes it worse. So don't leave the house empty. Don't leave your head empty. Don't just sit around and think in idle stuff. Be on purpose about your thought life. Because the enemy will put stuff in your mind in a second. Paul says in Philippians 4, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble and just and pure, whatever things are lovely and of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He tells you what to think about. I love to think about the things of God. I love to think about the stories. That's why we started with this story with Elisha. I love to think about how God has worked through his people over the years. Because we've concluded in today's church that that part of God, that season of God is done. No. I can't wait to see something supernatural. I mean, I'm talking spectacular. Now, listen, I, I say that cautiously because in today's church, a lot of times we miss the supernatural because we're waiting on something spectacular to happen. The supernatural is going on every day around you. The supernatural is going on in you right now. But so often because we're these carnal, emotion-led people, we want to feel the presence of God. Now, thank God that we feel the presence of God. Just because you cried a little bit? Well, I cry at a movie. That doesn't mean the presence of God is any stronger because you cried. You may have felt it a little more and praise God for that. Are you all okay? See, God's truth will always override the enemy's lies. And his most successful tactic, man, it's manipulating our thoughts. That's what he does best. You'll never get that. You're not going to walk in healing. Matter of fact, God doesn't even heal anymore today. What Bible are you reading? Huh? You think about it. When you're in the project, when you're in a renovation project, I remember when I was talking with Chad about his house, they just went through one, and he had this load-bearing wall that ran all the way across his living room. Well, he couldn't just go in and take it out. Y'all know what would happen if he did? 
the roof would collapse. See, there are load-bearing walls. You can't just go in and start knocking stuff out. You've got to do your research. You've got to be prepared. You actually have to replace that load-bearing wall. If it's a special beam, that, and that's what Chad, he got a, a special beam made to go in and put in the place to carry the load. You can't just take stuff out. Some of you all, you've got load-bearing thoughts built up, in strongholds in your mind that you've worked on, that you've established for years, and they're holding all kinds of your junk up. And when you go in and just try to take that out, well, the enemy's not playing that game with you. He knows you all too well. You may succeed for a day. I, I read my Bible. Gravy, I read six chapters today. Listen, the enemy doesn't care how much you read until you start doing some of it. Huh? See, these, these fixed structures in houses... Just like fixed structures or strongholds in our mind, those are thoughts that Paul is trying to get us to understand. This is why you can't, guys, you can't just erase wrong thoughts from your mind. They won't just go away. They're, they're fixed. You have to replace them with something else. This is Paul's point. When he's writing to this young church in, in Corinthians, he says this, guys. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about this. He says, we are not simply humans anymore. And because of that, we no longer war. Listen very carefully. Why would he use the word war? Because there is a war. We, if you don't believe me, try it today. There will literally be a war that will rage in your... What are you doing out here already, man? I blame John. He took all my preaching time. <laughs> Why do, think about it. Why does Paul use this word? In 2 Corinthians, he says, we're no longer human, so we no longer war according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What's a stronghold? It is a load-bearing wall that you've built up in your life, in your thinking. He says that we cast down arguments, those are thoughts, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, watch this very carefully, and we bring every, say every, say every, say every, we bring every thought. Is he for real? Every thought? We bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So when you have thoughts that are telling you something contrary to what the Lord has told you, take that thought captive and replace it. You have to find scriptures. you got to find promises of God, and you have to begin to speak them over your life on a regular basis because what will happen as you're speaking the word and speaking the word and speaking the word and speaking the word, all of a sudden you're taking out that load-bearing wall and putting in a new one. You're replacing that old junk with something from God. And once that gets settled in you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He enlarges my path so that I don't slip. He is my vengeance. I am 100% I am confident. That's why I, I, I stay cool with stuff most of the time. Yeah, because God's got my back. I know that. When everything doesn't look right, when everything doesn't go right, y'all ever been in a situation where everything didn't go right? Yeah. You take every thought captive. I know it doesn't look right, right, looking, you know, right now. I know my circumstances doesn't look that good right now, but God's got me. Elisha and his servant was surrounded by the enemy. It's okay, God's got me. You may have one nostril above water. God's got me. Huh? See, this is the thing you have to understand, getting rid of those strongholds. Be convinced that God is doing something perfect in your life, developing something in you. It's not just about you. And, and Because here's the thing about a stronghold. You think you're right. Y'all ever met a know-it-all? Just keep looking this way. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Listen, there are, there are times when all of us in some area, we are know-it-alls. 
the thing is when you have these strongholds and you become convinced that you're right you're a know-it-all and you're not right all the time Paul makes this statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 are y'all okay I, I'll give you just a couple I'm, I'm, I'm gonna end I gotta, I gotta at least introduce a thought for next Sunday okay and then we'll, we'll get you out of here but in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians Paul says this because I'm talking now I'm, I'm talking to the know-it-alls now don't don't uh, we all fit this <laughs> knowledge puffs up but love edifies I like to say it like this knowledge puffs up you know what that means you know what when you puff something up you full of hot air knowledge puffs up but love builds up Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This passage in the New Living, it says it like this, while knowledge makes us feel important, it's love that strengthens us. And anyone, now you gotta, you gotta go check this out later, it's 1 Corinthians in cha uh, chapter eight. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. <laughs> I am reading the Bible, okay? But the person who loves God is the one who God recognizes. And I can tell you, as you look over the landscape of our culture today, the intellectual society has exalted itself above everything. We have an education system that thinks there's something they're not. Parents, you should tread very lightly where your child goes to school at the next level. Yeah, but they need an education. I agree, they do need an education. What kind? My staff showed me a, a comedian the other day, a, a clip from one of his shows, and he's got a teenage daughter that just went off to college. And she comes back home after her first year, and he says, what happened to you? I spent $40,000, and in one year, you come home stupid. <laughs> he may have used a few colorful words in there, you know. But you need to pray about it and be very selective where your child goes to school, especially if you're paying for it. Because we live in a society, we, this is known as the information age. And we think because we've inventoried a bunch of information. I can tell you as a pastor over the years, one of the things, because when I tell people what I do for a living so often, the, especially the intellectual world, because they think they've arrived at some place, because they've accumulated knowledge, they look at me like, oh, bless your heart. They don't realize how much ignorance just poured out of their mouth. Because according to the Apostle Paul, when you, you're the one that thinks you know something, you really don't know anything. That's why he says love is the most important thing. See, when we learn this concept, now what are we talking about? We're talking about renovation. We're talking about changing who we are, and it starts with our thinking, you all. So this week, I want you to self-evaluate. Do some inventory of your life. Are you ready for this? Start your innovation project. For some of y'all, you know what that means first? You got to get rid of some junk. You got to clean out your closets. How many of you are pack rats? Bunch of lying church people. I know some of you. Okay, my bad, not pack rat, hoarder. <laughs> that might help you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, take, you take a semi-truck just to get rid of the stuff you don't use anymore. Well, it's got sentimental value. Really? <laughs> no, that's got to go. My wife has a rule at our house. If we ain't wore it in a year, it's out. Amen. It's out, man. I'm like, babe, where'd my, where'd my favorite sweatpants go? Out. <laughs> yeah. Make some room. Now listen, don't let the enemy get into your head with condemnation. 
We're all going to fail. We're all going to mess up. You're going to take out something. You're going to break something in a renovation project. You're going to tear a faucet up when you didn't mean it. Oh, I wanted to keep that one. So when you start and everything doesn't go right, don't beat yourself up. Tell the enemy to shut up. Resist him. Make a spot this week for God. Ask him what yours looks like. Write stuff down. Don't just think it. Ink it or type it, whatever. Get you a, get you a renovation project list because we're going to spend a couple weeks on this. Huh? Knowledge puffs up. Love does what? Yeah, love builds up. So you know where we're going next week, right? We're going to talk about love. The love boat. Exciting. Only the old people laugh at that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Before I get out of here, you know, you know how I like to do things. If you're in the room and you've never given Jesus a chance in your life, today's your day. If you're listening to me and there's a thought that's rolling around in the back of your head, yep, that's the Lord pulling on your heart. Yeah, but I don't know if I like you. Well, that's okay, but you're here. We are asking you to give your life to Jesus, not Victory Life Church. If the Lord sends you here, that's great. We'd love to have you, but the most important decision you will ever make, eternity hangs in the balance for you. Don't leave here today without Jesus. Those of you listening or watching, stop what you're doing for a second. The Lord's calling on you right now. Give Jesus a chance. We have made it so simple. All you got to do is believe in your heart, confess it with your mouth, and you're saved. If there's a lot more to the Christian life. Not without that, there's not. That's where you start. Jesus made it that simple on purpose because he knew we'd be involved in it. Religion and tradition is what's messed it up. Oh, pastor, you need to have them walk the aisle. Said who? I've led people to, to, in a restaurant to Christ. There is no aisle to walk. What are you talking about? That's just church junk, man. So whatever you're doing, if you're in the room or you're listening or watching, say the prayer with us. Give Jesus a chance. Church, let's help him. Lord Jesus, Come into my life and make me new. And from this day forward, Jesus is my Lord. Heaven is my home. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're here, stop by our information desk if you said that prayer. Let us give you a gift to get you started on your journey of faith. For the rest of you, you know what time it is. It's renovation time. You know, get your tool belt, get your work list, get your checklist, get it going. Make this week a week that you're going to be on purpose about starting your Reno project. Amen.